All right, let's get the lights a little bit more acclimated. Okay, lecture 31, let's get started. Um, how did the column homework go? It, I'm, I'm glad because that one, I know it was kind of weird because it would, it would have been nice if the schedule worked out where we did that over break, but again, I wanted to give you that Friday off like I, uh, like I promised, so we put that off till Monday. Um, today we begin our discussion of, I don't want to say it's our final topic because we have one day on local buckling, but it really is kind of our final big topic in the class, which is beams, okay? In other words, elements being bent, okay? Um, and so we're going to be on this topic for quite a while. Um, I mean, you can do the math. We'll be on this for about three weeks. Um, to put it in perspective, <coughs> we're going to take beams and we're going to sort of separate it into two categories. And we're going to call those continuously braced beams and discreetly braced beams. Okay? And the main idea behind what we're talking about is the following. Okay? When you have a column and you load it in compression, what is the, the, the failure phenomenon? What does it want to do? It wants to buckle, right? Well, let's think about this from a beam perspective. Okay? With beams, the top of the beam, so if we beam, uh, bend an element in positive bending, right? So we smiley face it, right? The top of the beam is experiencing compression. The bottom of the beam is experiencing tension, okay? Um, the top of the beam wants to buckle. The bottom doesn't, okay? And the beam doesn't really know what to do with that other than to sort of do this kick out and twist effect. So when you take a beam and you bend it, it sort of like does this. It sort of like rolls over and twists. Y'all see that? We take it and just sort of does that. There is a, a name for that, and it's called lateral torsional buckling because it sort of kicks out and twists, so lateral torsional. Um, whether or not that's going to happen is going to be a function of whether or not the beam is braced or how effectively it's braced. Okay? So what we're going to do in beam design is we're going to assume two scenarios. The first we're going to assume is that the beam is continuously braced so that buckling is not an issue. And then after that, we'll look at, well, what if it's not? Okay, what if it's only discreetly braced? What if it only has bracing every so often? Okay, and we usually start with continuously braced because for discreetly braced beams, the maximum possible capacity is as if it is continuously braced. So that, that's sort of why we're, we're starting here. But today's lecture is sort of a, let's just sort of brush off the, the cobwebs on flexural theory because it's been, it's been a while, I imagine, since a lot of you have talked about this. This is uh, a lot of engineering 216 land, a lot of mechanics of deformable bodies. Um, but I, I am sort of softly introducing some of that stuff again, so because um, I know it's been a while since you've seen it. So what we're going to talk about is elastic bending and then ultimately <coughs> uh, this idea of inelastic capacity and what we're going to call a plastic moment. And then how we have a shortcut for computing plastic moments using a new section property, which we call Z or ZX, okay? So to begin, let's just sort of like take it back to square one a little bit, okay? Now this stuff here, um, I'm assuming everybody in here has seen this in some fashion or another, okay? Some of this on this slide you saw in my class last semester in structural analysis. For example, if you have a beam, and let's just say it's a simply supported beam, and you're putting a uniformly distributed load on it, you know that you get reactions, you get a shear diagram that looks like this, and you get a bending moment diagram that looks something about like this, right? I've gotta believe that you all remember that, right? That, that's gotta be comfortable, okay? So if we're talking about a beam and we're loading it you know, on the top, the worst case bending scenario is in the middle, right? Which I mean, that kinda makes sense. If I have a table here and I put a bunch of load on the top of it, the place where the worst case scenario is where it's being bent is right here in the middle. Okay, and we can calculate that either with structural analysis, you know, draw actually draw the shear diagram, draw the moment diagram, or we can use those you know shortcut formulas, which in here we're actually going to use a lot of. Okay, now this will give us the moment, the 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 um, force resultant, as it were. But we all know that from a design standpoint and from a mechanic standpoint, that it's usually a lot uh, better to look at things in terms of stresses, right? You know, pressure for fluids, stresses for solids. And so the fundamental expression for stresses from bending is sigma equals my over i. That should be pretty familiar, right? So the idea is that we take our bending moment, we take the section property, the moment of inertia, and we can determine the stress from how far away we are from the centroid, from the neutral axis of the beam. 
Okay. Now, going into that stress formula a little bit, you know, here's a beam. Take that beam and I bend it. Okay, so I'm bending it about its weak axis because it's easier to show the bend, uh, deflected shape. So here's the beam once it's being bent. The top of the beam is experiencing compression, right? It's being squished together. The bottom of the beam is being stretched apart, right? It's being pulled apart. This line right here down the middle, this line right here, that's the neutral axis where it's really not seeing any um, uh, 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 stress at all, okay? So what we're basically saying is that if we look at the stress right here in the middle, the stress is zero. But as we get away from the, um, uh, the centroid or from the neutral axis, the stresses increase, okay? So in a beam, the worst case stresses are either the very, very, very tippy, tippy top of the beam or the very, 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 very bottom of the beam, which we call the extreme fibers. So basically, if here's the beam and it's being bent, the worst case bending stresses are right here on the top surface or right here on the bottom surface. With me so far? And so this sigma equals my over i is just a line. It's just like y equals mx plus b. It's just the intercept is right here. Okay? So we have a shortcut in, <coughs> in mechanics, and we basically say, look, we know that the worst case scenario is either at the top or the bottom. So instead of computing sigma equals my over i, I'll just take sigma equals m over s, and s is what we're going to call the section modulus. And the section modulus is just the moment of inertia divided by that extreme fiber distance, the distance from the center to the very top or from the center to the very bottom. With me so far? Okay. So the point I'm making is, and if you'll notice here a lot of the notation, like why don't you open it up to table 1-1 just to sort of make the point. Um, so I'm looking here at just the W shapes, right? I'm just looking at the standard W shapes. And if you look, you can see that for any rolled uh, W shape section, uh, look over here on the right page, and we have the x-axis, right? Um, what do we have here for the x-axis? We have an I property, an S property, an R property, and then this Z property. What the heck's going on with that? I mean, um, Hopefully that stuff's starting to make sense. I mean, I is just the moment of inertia. S is just the section modulus. Um, R, we've been dealing with R all semester. That's just the radius of gyration. Z, we have yet to explain. So we're going to talk about Z today. With me so far? Okay, so let's bring it back to mechanics of materials, mechanics of deformable bodies. So what if I'm trying to determine a flexural capacity of a I beam? Let's say I'm trying to determine the maximum amount of moment that this thing could see. Well, what mechanics of deformable body says is they say, look, this is the stress profile, right? So the worst case bending stresses are at the very top or the very bottom. So maybe a simple way of thinking about this is why don't we just set these extreme stresses equal to Fy, equal to the yield stress, okay? And so we'll say, okay, let's set this equal to Fy and if Fy equals M over S, let's solve for M, and M is what we're going to call the yield moment, okay? The yield moment being uh, the yield stress times the section modulus. In other words, this is the maximum amount of moment that I can put on the beam and assume it's going to behave elastically, assume it's going to behave like a rubber band, okay? Um, now, um, if we were in Engineering 216, I would say that is the maximum amount of moment that a beam can withstand. Because a lot of what we learn in Engineering 216 is elastic behavior. We treat all our elements like a rubber band. We put a load on it, we let, uh, we let that load go, it snaps back to its original geometry. Um, but MY is not the maximum moment that a beam can withstand. A beam can actually withstand a lot more than that, assuming it's compact and whatnot. We'll explain what that means uh, a little bit later. So just to sort of like get everybody into the swing of things. Um, <clears throat> let's just take this beam, and I, just so everybody's aware, I've got all these calculations in the slide, so, you, I mean, uh, and I've got these slides on Blackboard, so if you don't follow along everything that I'm writing here, that's okay, but I'm also not gonna ask you to do this anyways. So this is really stuff that you did last year, and I'm just sort of like getting you back into the swing of things, okay? So let's just look at this beam. This is a symmetric beam, and it's really simple, right? So I've got a 12-inch by 1-inch top flange and bottom flange, and then the web 
is 24 inches by one inches. So from a real world standpoint, this is not a really real world example because we really wouldn't build uh, a plate girder with a one inch thick web that's only 24 inches deep. But I'm just choosing these numbers because they're really simple. They're mathematically pretty simple. All right. Um, <coughs> this section is symmetric, okay? So the centroid or the neutral axis is right smack dab here in the middle, okay? Now, um, what I'll tell you is um, I'm going to compute the moment of inertia here on the next slide, and I'm going to do it the long way, okay? And what I mean by that is because this section is symmetric, I could probably compute this in like one step by hand, but I'm doing it the long way because if you know how to do it the long way for a symmetric section, you know how to do it for a non-symmetric section. Um, now, let's just sort of um, fast forward a bit. So there's a lot going on here, so let's take a step back. Um, let's see if you all remember how to do this. So if you're computing the moment of inertia uh, of a composite shape, basically what you're doing is you're using the parallel axis theorem. All right, And the parallel axis theorem says that if you want to compute the moment of inertia for the whole thing, what you take is the moment of inertia for each itty bitty shape plus the area of that shape times d squared. Okay, and then you sum all that up. And d is the distance from the centroid of each little uh, itty bitty shape to the centroid of the whole thing. Okay, so the first thing you've got to do is you've got to compute the centroid. So I guess my first question is do you all recognize this first part of the table right here? Like sum of a y divided by sum of a, y'all remember that? that? That should be familiar from statics, right? The, in order to compute the centroid. Now, I, I'm being blunt. This is not really necessary for this shape because I know where the centroid is, right? The centroid's right here in the middle, okay? But I'm doing it the long way because when it's not symmetric, you kind of have to go through this process. So <coughs> what I'm doing is I compute the moment of inertia of each individual shape. By the way, I'm just curious. Y'all remember how to compute the moment of inertia of a rectangle? I'll give you a hint. It's BH cubed divided by something. There you go, BH cubed over 12. So we take BH cubed over 12 for each of these rectangles. We get really tiny values for the top flange and the bottom flange because the height is really tiny. But for the web, the height's really big. So we get a really big value here, tiny values here. We take this D value. The D value is the distance from the centroid of the whole thing to the centroid of each shape. That's why it's zero here for the middle. It doesn't really matter whether you subtract one way or subtract another. Because this value, whether this value is positive and this value is negative or vice versa, it doesn't really matter because you're going to square it. Okay, so we take I plus AD squared, sum all this up, and we get a moment of inertia of about 4,900 inches to the fourth. Okay, all right. Um, and remember, the moment of inertia is really just a measure of flexural stiffness. The bigger that value is, the harder it is to bend. Right. So if you look at this rubber I beam, it's got a bigger moment of inertia this way than it does this way which is why it's easier to do that. It's why when you go to your um, deck in your backyard and you look at all the floor joists, the floor joists are facing upright. They're not facing like that because you've got a bigger moment of inertia that way. So far so good? Okay. All right. So if I wanted to compute a yield moment, what I would say is, okay, um, I've got 4,900 inches to the fourth. I can compute a section modulus by just taking 4,900 and dividing it by 13 from the center to the very tippy top or the center to the very bottom. Uh, and getting this as my section modulus, Fy times that will give me the yield moment. Now, units wise, I'm going to take KSI times inches to the third, and I'm going to get inch kips. You all know in moments, we kind of like to deal with moments and foot kips. So I'm going to take this yield moment, divide it by 12, and then I'm going to get, this is 15,781 foot kips, or I don't know, 1.57 million foot pounds, you know, something like that. Okay. Um, so that's our yield moment, okay? Now, my question is, is that the largest moment that the beam can withstand? Engineering 216 says yes. I say no, okay? Here's why, all right? So here's my bending stress profile, right? So here's this, and we're saying that here's the bending stress profile, and this is Fy, and this is Fy, right? So the question is, all right, Let's, let's say here, okay, so if I put 1,571 foot kips of moment on the beam, this is the bending stress profile I look like. 
So my question is, what if I put a little bit more? What if I just up the moment a little bit? What would happen? Well, if I increased the moment a little bit, here's what I propose would happen. Um, this point right here, I say has yielded. What about that point? Has that point yielded? No, it's, it can still take a little bit more stress. So I propose what happens if you increase the yield moment just a little bit is that it looks like this. That the yielding will just penetrate through the section a little bit. Okay? And in fact, if you keep on increasing the yield moment, you'll get something that looks like this. Or, sorry, if you keep on increasing the applied moment, you'll get something that looks like this. So here's the eye shape, and here's the yield moment. But if you keep on applying moment, that yielding starts to penetrate throughout the section until you get this. Okay? And this situation is when the entire cross section has yielded. Does that make sense? This over here is the yield moment, but this is what we call the plastic moment. Okay? This is when the entire section has reached MY and can no longer resist moment. We have a name for this. We say that if we have a point in a beam that has reached MP, let's say we have a beam and let's say that this point right here has reached MP, we say that a plastic hinge has been created. Remember from structural analysis, we said that a hinge was a point that could not resist moment? That's why, right? Because right here, you know, we have no moment where we can't resist any more moment. All right? So this is MP, okay? With me so far? So just to give you a slight little spoiler alert, if MY is FY times the section modulus, MP is going to be FY times this new term Z. Okay, So that's what that term Z is. Okay, If you look right here, look at the W shapes, look at all the Z values. They're all bigger than the corresponding S values because you can always withstand a little bit more moment. Okay, But don't worry. Uh, we'll, we'll go through how to compute that here in a bit. With me so far? Okay. Any questions? Okay. So, <coughs> something that I imagine is probably brewing in the back of your head is, like, MP sounds more challenging. It sounds more difficult. That's actually not the case. I promise you that computing MY is computationally more intensive than computing MP. MP is really pretty easy okay and so let me kind of explain so what we're essentially saying is that the entire cross section has achieved a uniform stress that uniform stress is fy okay so for each element in the cross section we'll say okay if the stress is uniform then the stress times the area will give us the force in every element of the cross section right so I can get the force in the top flange, the force in the bottom flange, et cetera. Okay? So if I got the force in every element and I have a moment arm, I can just sum all that up and by golly gosh gee, I have a moment. Okay? Because force times moment arm will give you a moment. Okay? So if I want to compute the plastic moment, I just take Fy times the area of each element times the moment arm for each element. But Fy is the same for all these pieces. So if I just factor out Fy, I get this, the sum of the area times the moment arm. And this, this is Z. This is this new uh, uh, section property. So the reason why we do this is because if you look at what I have here, this term Z, what's inside here? I have areas of the girder and I have distances for the girder. So this term A, or this term Z is a section property. Like, here's the I-beam, right? When you look up, when you go to table 1-1, you're looking up section properties. Like, how deep is it? How thick is this? What is this dimension? You're looking up a radius of gyration, uh, you know, a moment of inertia. By formulating it this way, we can calculate a section property for every one of these shapes and just look it up. Okay? So that's the value of writing it this way, and that's why we have these terms listed. Okay? <coughs> so far, so good? Okay. So let me show you how ZX works, okay? 
So Z is really easy. Like I said, the way that we compute Z is we just sum up the area of each plate times the moment arm. And what's the moment arm? The moment arm is the distance from the centroid of the whole thing to the middle of each shape. So like for example, if I want to compute Z, let's just walk through this. So how am I doing it? So I'm saying, okay, let's take one, two, three, four. I've got four different elements. How do I do that? Let's take this first one. What's the area? The area of this plate right here is 12 square inches. And how far is it from the centroid of the whole thing to the center of this? Well, this is 24 inches, so this is 12 and a half. Does everybody see that? What about this upper portion of the web? That area is 12. How far is it from here to here? It's six, right? Because this is 12, so half that's six. And so I just repeat that over and over again, and I get a Z value, Z times Y, convert, boom, done. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to do. Uh, uh, it's a lot easier to compute Z. So my two observations is that Z is much easier to compute than S, and Z is always bigger than S, okay? So MP is always bigger than MY, okay? All right, with me so far? Don't worry, we're going to have an example on this here in a second. So far, so good? Okay. So this is all well and good. Up until now, we've been dealing with symmetry, okay? So we've been dealing with sections that are symmetric. And to be clear, all of your rolled shapes, like all your rolled W shapes, they are symmetric. But that doesn't mean we're always using symmetric shapes in the real world. And a good example of where we're not using symmetric shapes are bridges. Okay. In bridge land, we are configuring the, the size of the top flange, the web, and the bottom flange to meet not only the final stress state of the finished product, but also varying stress states throughout the bridge's construction. See, in bridge land, um, because, I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about if you're, um, uh, uh, if you're constructing a bridge, you know they have those shear studs welded on the top flange so that when they cast the deck, the top flange and the... Uh, the deck, they sort of lock together. So if you're thinking about it from a beam land, top end compression, bottom end tension, the top flange gets to take uh, advantage of the fact that there's a big old concrete deck on top of it that can take in, uh, into account some of that compression, right? So the top flange doesn't need to be as big as the bottom flange, which is hanging out in space and can only resist the bending moments by itself. So typically in like simply supported plate girders, the compression flange is smaller than the tension flange. So, so how do we handle that? Okay, I'm going to throw something out there, which you're probably going to look at me a little weird. Um, okay, if I asked you to define the centroid, like I'm not talking about math, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying if you were to tell me what the centroid is, you would probably say something like, well, the centroid is about where the middle of the shape is, right? Uh, right? Okay. I propose to you that whenever we're dealing with asymmetry or non-symmetric sections, we sort of need to define two centroids. Or more specifically, a better way of, uh, of verbing it is two neutral axes. Okay, so I'm going to use the term elastic neutral axis, and I'm going to use plastic neutral axis. Okay, now the term elastic neutral axis is going to be where the centroid is. Okay, so if I have a shape and I do sum of AY over sum of A, and I get a value, that's where the elastic neutral axis is. But the plastic neutral axis is where the area on top equals the area on the bottom. And I propose to you that for non-symmetric sections, those are not in the same place all the time, okay? And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna have an example that, that shows you that. And I know the first time that you sometimes hear that, you go, wait, shouldn't that be in the same place? Not necessarily. It's a different mathematical expression. Okay, so let's just sort of go through the process of of working this out. Okay, so I have a non-symmetric beam here, and I want to compute um, I want to compute zx for this beam. Okay, and specifically zx and mp. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the um, sx and the my calculation looks like, and you'll see. It's, they're not in the same place, okay? So let me get my keyboard off so I can write on this. Okay. 
All right, so we're going to compute ZX for this beam, okay? And specifically, so the section's being bent about its horizontal axis. So we're bending it like the way you would expect, like, like that, okay? So I want to compute ZX, okay? Um, in order to compute ZX, I need to find the point in which the area on top equals the area below. So I got to find this magic line somewhere about right here where the area above equals the area below. So let's see how we're going to do that. Okay. So let's see. 14 by 3 quarter, 18 by 1 and a quarter. Sixteen or eighteen by one and a quarter. Sorry, eighteen by one and a quarter. Okay. Now, this right here is five eighths. Okay. All right. I need to find this magic line right here where the area above equals the area below. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line. like that. Okay. And I'm trying to find where this line is. So right now I don't know. Okay. So what I'm going to say is when I don't know, let's call this term X. Okay. All right. Now if this is X, okay, what is this distance? Help me out. 32 minus x. Okay. All right. <coughs> so now what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, Let's calculate the upper area. And let's see what we can figure out. So what is the area above this line? Okay. So the area above this line, and I need some help with the Casio FX115 ES pluses or similar scientific calculators. So we have 14 times 3 quarters plus what? plus 5 eighths times 32 minus x. Okay, so what's 14 times 3 quarters? Uh, is that 11 point five? What is it? 10.5. 10.5. Okay, now what about this right here? So we got to distribute. So we're going to have 5 eighths times 32. So that's what, um, 20? 20? Minus 0 0.625x. Okay. So is that, is that okay? Everybody good? Okay. Now what about the lower area? So the bottom area is going to be the area of this plate plus now it's just going to be 5 x x. So what's 18 times 1.25? I'm not that good. Hmm? Mm 
<clears throat> okay, wait, wait, wait. I, I made a boo boo right here. Nobody caught me on that. I want to remember that. Okay. With me so far? So if I want to find X, what do I do? There you go. Set the two equal to one another and solve for X. So, whoop. Sorry, I didn't mean to scroll like that. Therefore, Okay, so I'm going to add that to both sides. So right, so that's going to cancel. Then I'm going to subtract 22.5 and that's going to cancel. So over here on the left, 30.5 minus 22.5, man, my screen is being jumpy today, is 8, and then 0 0.625 plus 0 0.625 is 1 and a quarter. And what is that? 6.4? Do I have a second on that? Okay. So I propose that 6.4 is the magic line where the area above equals the area below. And I'm telling you that if you compute the centroid, sum of AY over sum of A, it is not going to be at the same spot. Okay? So far so good? All right, any questions on that? Okay, now this is determining the location of the P and A, but this is not ZX. Okay, so let's determine ZX. By the way, what is 32 minus this? What is that? 25.6. Keep that number uh, for me. All right, so now let's determine ZX. Okay, so I'm going to redraw my cross section again. That was 14 by 3 quarters, right? The top flange? Yeah. Okay, all right. So, okay. 25.6? Okay, and then this is 5 eighths. Okay, I'm an engineer, so I like tables. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna split this up into four shapes. So we'll say one, two, three, four. So one and four are the top and bottom flange, and then two and three, this is the web, but this is the web above the area and the web below, okay? So far, so good? Okay, so let's do shape one, two, three, four. All right, let's do the area first. So um, let's see. This one and this one, I think we already computed uh, as 30 or 10.5 and 22.5. Can somebody check me on that? Make sure I got that right. I left my notebook upstairs. Okay, all right, so let's do shape two. 
So what is 25.6 times 5 eighths? 16 even. Okay, what about shape 3? 6.4 times 5 eighths. 4? Okay. So, first off, did we find the magic line where the area above equals the area below? Did we? I mean, what's this plus this? 26.5? What's that plus that? 26.5. So we, we did that right, right? So that's a nice little check, okay? Ah. Okay. So now let's do the y distances, okay? And so what we're basically saying is that y is the distance from the P and A to the center of each rectangle or the centroid of each individual shape. So let's just take shape one, okay? How do I get from the P and A to the center of that? How do I do that? What do I do? I go from here to here, which is? And then how much do I go? Yes, so 25.6 plus 3 eighths is what? Somebody help me out. And I'm going to track all my decimals on this because I want to just make sure we're all following what we're doing. Second? Okay. Now what about two? How do I get from here to the center of that? Half of 25.6, so 12 and a half to 12.8? 12.8. So what about three? Shape three. Half, is it half of four? Half of 6.4, which is 3.2. I can do that one in my head. And this one's 6.4 plus half of that. I might need some help on that. Do I have a second? Am I good on that? Okay. So now what we're going to do is in order to compute Z, just multiply each of these. So this times this, this times this, this times this, this times this. So somebody help me out. And let's just do like two decimal places for this. I, we don't need to go any further than that. So what's this times this? I'll scooch that up a bit. Do I have a second? Yeah. Okay. Next one. Second. Okay. This one should be 12.8. I can do that one in my head. Pass that. I need help on that. Second? Okay. So now what we'll do is sum these up. So what's the sum of these for? And I think it actually comes out to a nice round number. Or pretty close. Do I have a second? Okay. So therefore, okay. So let's let's go ahead and compute MP and then I want to explain why I drew this on the board. So So the plastic moment, the actual moment capacity is pretty easy. So MP is just uh, FY times ZX. And we'll assume 50 KSI. Okay, so what's 50 times that?
32, 420. Do I have a second? Okay. So if I want that in foot kips, what do I need to do? Divide by 12, and what is that? 2,701.68. Let's just do that. And so there we go. Not too hard, right? Pretty simple. Okay. For those of you that have had concrete design, do you, rem not this part, not this. Do you remember this? Okay, for those of you that have not had concrete design, just to give you a quick overview of what we're looking at here, what we're looking at is a concrete beam. A concrete beam that is singly reinforced. And what singly reinforced means is this is concrete, right? Remember, concrete behaves very well in compression, but very poorly in tension. So we put or rebar where the tension is, at the bottom. It's singly reinforced because we only have rebar at the bottom. If we put rebar and, uh, at the bottom and at the top, it would be doubly reinforced. Okay. Now, um, concrete behaves poorly in tension, so we assume its tensile capacity is zero. But its compressive capacity is a single, we assume, a single uniform stress block that's essentially this area right here in compression. And you're like, well, what is that area? Well, that area is the width times this magic value A, okay? Now, what we say is, okay, this is the amount of force that's in compression. And the amount of force that's in compression is the area of this block times 0.85 FC prime. We assume 0.85 FC prime as a maximum allowable stress for concrete just as we assume Fy is a maximum allowable stress for steel. So in concrete, the compressive force is 0.85 Fc prime times AB. The tensile force is the area of the steel times Fy. And then whenever you want to compute the flexural capacity of a beam in concrete, what you basically do is you say you set C equals to T, and you say what is the value of A such that these two are equal to one another. Kind of like what is the value of x such that the two areas are equal to one another, right? See the similarities? Okay. Um, we found this value of x such as the area above equals the area below. Well, why don't we do areas over here? Well, the reason we don't do areas over here is because we're dealing with two different materials. We're dealing with concrete and steel. So because we're dealing with concrete and steel, we have to deal in force equilibrium. Whereas with this, it's steel and steel. We can subtract out the, the yield or factor out the yield stresses and just worry about areas. Does that make sense? So, and then what do you do? You say, okay, um, A, well, so, I mean, let's, let's go back to concrete. So we say, okay, um, 0 0.85 FC prime AB has to equal ASFY. And so you solve for A. For my folks that have had concrete designs, does this look familiar? Okay, and then how do you determine moment capacity? Well, moment capacity is a force times a moment arm. Again, for you steel folks, if you take concrete design next semester, you'll see it. What is the force? Well, the force could be either one of these. It doesn't matter because the forces are equal. So what do I do? I'll take the smaller one since I'm lazy. And what's the moment arm? The moment arm is the distance from this force to this force, right? It's like a force couple from statics. And what is this distance? Well, it's the depth minus A over 2. Does that equation look familiar from reinforced concrete design? Well, by golly gosh, she, that's where it comes from. So it all comes together. Okay. Enough. That's enough of a side tangent diatribe. Um, this is steel design, so we're supposed to have a negative opinion about concrete. We're supposed to say there's only two types of concrete in this world, and that's wet and cracked. So, um, <laughs> don't tell Dr. Zatara I said that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So far, so good? Okay. So, just so you are aware, um, this is this beam, and I decided, you know what? Let's go ahead and do all that moment of inertia stuff to show you, and look where the centroid is, right? 
So I do, so what am I doing here? I'm taking sum of AY over sum of A and I'm re referencing everything from the bottom. And the centroid here is like 13.4 inches from the bottom. That is not the same place where the PNA was. The PNA was like 6.4 inches from here, right? That's different. The reason why is that as you penetrate yielding throughout the section, as you go from MY to MP, that neutral axis has to move in order to maintain equilibrium of the shapes. That's why you get a different location for the elastic neutral axis than you do the plastic neutral axis. So, so there you go. So when you go through all this math, and you're more than welcome to do this on your own. By the way, what software program do you think would be really great for this? This is an Excel for problem if I've ever seen one. Okay, So we can do all this in Excel. We get a moment of inertia like this. Um, when we calculate the... Uh, 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 so let's summarize everything. This stuff right here, this is what we just calculated. Now I'm saying that the PNA is 7.65. We got 6.4 because it was 6.4 from here. From the bottom, you add a, another one and a quarter, right? So from the bottom, the PNA is 7.65. This is what we got for ZX and this is what we got for MP. It's like I can crystal ball this stuff. Like I can just predict what the answer is going to be. It's crazy, right? But this is what MP is, but this is what MY is, right? So with MY, we've got the centroid. Now, because the section is non-symmetric, we have a section modulus for the top and a section modulus for the bottom because these two distances are different. These two extreme fiber distances are different. So we basically say that MY is just the yield stress times whichever these two is smaller. And again, MY is smaller than MP, okay? Does this make sense? Okay. I threw a lot of probably unexpected theory at you today. So let me take a sec and see if anybody has any questions. Oh, let me go back. Right, hold on. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay. All right. So I want to summarize a couple things. Um, so if we're dealing with symmetric sections, like a symmetric section would be like a W shape. Because it's symmetric, the elastic neutral axis and the plastic neutral axis are at the same spot. I mean, think, this is symmetric. This section is symmetric. The centroid is right there, right? That's about where the centroid is. But it's also the location where the area above equals the area below. So because of symmetry, we can, uh, um, it can make things a lot easier for us. There's only one section modulus, and MP is larger than MY. But if we're dealing with non-symmetric sections, the ENA and the PNA are not at the same spot. We will have two S values, um, but again, MP is still larger than MY. Okay? I do have one final thing to show you. Okay? I want you all to turn to table 1-7, the angles. So is everybody in agreement that the elastic neutral axis and the plastic neutral axis are not in the same spot all the time, unless there's symmetry? Well, one section or one shape where there is no symmetry is an angle. Okay. Do you remember when we were doing tension members way back during the snowy days of January and February? And, and I said, look, here's the tension member. Right? When we were doing shear lag factors and we said 1 minus x bar over L, and I said, look, there's going to be an x bar and an x sub p, or a y bar and a y sub p. And I said back then, just ignore the y sub p. We'll talk about it later. Right? Remember that? Well, now we're talking about it. All right? What is this right here? Okay, so why do I have a y bar and a y sub p? What is the difference between y bar and y sub p? Y bar is where the centroid is. YP is where the plastic neutral axis is. They're not in the same spot, okay? Th that's what that was. I, back then, it was like, look, we'll talk about it later. Now we're talking about it, okay? Now, um, the only other thing I'll mention is that ZX really only makes sense um, if the cross-section is made out of the same grade of steel. Like the top flange, web, bottom flange, or all the different components of the cross-section all have to be the same grade. But it is possible that's not the case. So for example, it's possible that you have like a 50 KSI top flange, a 50 KSI web, 
and a 70 KSI bottom flange. We do that every now and then in bridges. It's called a hybrid girder. Uh, and whenever you're using a hybrid girder, um, ZX doesn't really make sense because ZX only makes sense when you're able to factor out FY. But if you have different FYs, you can't do that. So when you have different FYs, you really need to treat it more like this. Instead of looking at area equilibrium, you're looking at force equilibrium. So you basically take each one of those um, expressions in that equation above where we were solving for X and multiply each one of those uh, areas by their corresponding FY and then solve for X. So just want to throw that out there. Okay. Any questions? All right. Um, I think I, well, sorry, I kept you a couple minutes over, but I will give you some good news. You have a homework that's due Friday, but it is probably the shortest homework I've ever given in this class. You'll see what I mean. And have fun in Blacksburg for those of you that are going. We will see you all either on Friday or Monday, but I'll be here on Friday. So. <laughs>